Well, thanks everybody for coming out on such a beautiful Saturday. We really need people in this country who are interested in intellectual pursuits because I'm afraid that a lot of our society is going the opposite direction. So we, are, we appreciate your time with us this morning. I'd like to just introduce my friend Cliff Maloney, who is president of Young Americans for Liberty. He's going to be joining us in our, our conversation earlier this afternoon before the Judge Napolitano arrives. Uh, Cliff is someone I've known from, uh, actually, I believe, an internship in Dr. Ron Paul's office when he was still an undergraduate living in Pennsylvania. So uh, it's great to be reunited with him. He's somebody I've known for a long time, someone for whom I have a great deal of affection and respect. Uh, but the question before us, uh, which Cliff and I would like to discuss and also hopefully discuss with you as well, is whether it's too late for politics. Are we too far gone in America? In other words, there's a uh, divide in this country, and I'm sure you're all aware of it. We all feel it, especially if you spend much time on social media. Now, is it overstated? Are we really at each other's throats and coming apart like no other time in our history, even uh, the Vietnam era, the Civil War era? I don't know. That's hard to judge. But nonetheless, there's obviously something very, very wrong. And I think a lot of people feel that. And I think it results in things like uh, Bernie Sanders coming to the fore in a populist manner uh, as the potential Democratic nominee. There is a uh, PBS firing line series going on right now called America's Great Divide, which, it, which attempts to grapple with this problem or this topic. And I, I saw one recently with Steve Bannon, who is an advisor to the Trump campaign, and he's talking about how the cost of getting information whether about politics or whatever it might be has never been lower because we all have these cell phone devices in our pockets. And he says, you know, we're, we live in post-persuasion America, according to Bannon. There's no more sort of convincing the other side or sides about our viewpoint or the other. It's just about who wins and who mobilizes. And I thought that was a pretty interesting statement. Uh, you know, for my part, and, and speaking on behalf of the Mises Institute, of course, we'd like to see a less political world. It feels like we live in a highly politicized era where everything, even your food choices, your, your choices of, uh, of a partner in life, that sort of thing, become highly politicized. And we would like to, to move towards a society that is less politicized. In other words, a society where politics and government are not the central organizing feature, but rather markets and civil society are. So are, are we doing so? And if not... Uh, what should we do about it? Because we live today really in a lawless country. And when I say lawless, I don't mean that society, that you and me get away with being lawless. On the contrary, what I mean is that we have a lawless central government. The federal government in this country is comprised of men and women who basically do what they want to do uh, without restraint or constraint, either from the Constitution or from supposedly the other branches of government or from us voting or whether occasionally you know, one of us has the temerity to sue them in their own courts, that doesn't seem to be working out too well either. So we live in a lawless country of sorts. And what I'd like to talk about with Cliff is whether or not there is still time to use politics or political activism to do something about it or whether, in fact, we're too far gone. So taking the affirmative in a sense that, yes, uh, political activism still has merit and can still yield some sort of tangible benefits for us is my friend Cliff Maloney. So come on up, Cliff. Well, good morning. Um, debating Jeff Dice, and he's going second, is never a spot you want to be in. Uh, but I want to thank you for having me today. Jeff was my boss back in 2011 and 2012, uh, right before Ron retired. And uh, as I like to say, he was the first libertarian I met that was normal. And uh, I sadly mean that. Uh, he was a professional, a guy that really had it together, could communicate. And uh, I, I've always looked up to him for that. So appreciate uh, everything you've done, Jeff. Um, let me start by saying this. I think uh, you might be surprised, I'm not up here to say that political action is the answer. Um, I want to share some of my experience uh, just over the last five to six years. I'm, I'm newer to the movement, I'm 28 years old, um, so you can laugh at me, uh, don't, don't kick me off the stage, but let me just talk through some of the ways that I have seen us as a movement, and I talk about the, the broader libertarian movement, throw away millions and millions of dollars um, in political action in a way that I think has been in just absolutely, it's just been a huge mistake. And so let me start by saying, I think that we have this assumption that when we go out to talk about the ideas of liberty, people are listening, but they're not accepting them. I completely disagree. 
I don't think anyone is listening, right? You brought up Steve Bannon and what he said about just trying to mobilize. I don't think that folks out there are actually hearing and that we have an audience. They're taking in the issues and then saying, oh, you know, that's fringe. You know, we're not libertarian. We believe in this or we believe in this. I think most people are having a beer at night. They're trying to pay their mortgage. When we work with college students, you know, they're trying to find a girlfriend or boyfriend. I mean, people are just busy living their lives. And so in 2016, I took a job working for Rand Paul uh, when he was running for president. And I was his national youth director. And uh, I'm a fan of Rand Paul. Uh, I, I hope he would not take this as a shot. But after that campaign, I spent about two weeks just kind of thinking about how much money did we spend on these races? You know, what's the purpose when you're running for these big offices? And I just realized that the movement for so many years, we've kind of been just taking shots in the dark. If we're talking specifically about politics. Now, one of the premises I want to start with is I don't see political action as let's get 51 percent of politicians to be hardcore libertarians. I need everybody in the room. I'm going to ask Jeff to be with me on this. So I, I'm not saying that 51 percent of politicians will believe in the libertarian philosophy, vote that way and stay principled. What I'm looking for is, is there a way for us to utilize political activism to educate, to get the message out, to have a platform similar to what Ron did in 2012? Getting on the radar of so many individuals to get them interested because he had that platform. So Rand Paul's campaign wraps up. I'm sitting in a room with him and my predecessor, Jeff Frazee, and we're talking about where the movement should go from here. And it was a pretty blunt conversation because I said, no offense, but, you know, we just spent like 10 million bucks uh, a couple months later. You know, Trump's in the white. Like, what are you looking at that is exciting about, hey, let's do that again in terms of Rand 2016? And so I kind of sat down and I said, well, have we really ever thought about putting a system together where we can play against the powers that be and actually win? Yeah, we got Thomas Massey. I think half the room will boo me, half will cheer if I say, yeah, we got Justin Amash. <laughs> there are people you can point to that have a strong, principled, libertarian philosophy that are serving in the federal government. But we're talking about millions and millions of dollars. And so if you're with me, at least for the sake of this argument and saying that having a microphone is a good thing to be able to educate others, to be able to reach people, throwing or having to spend, you know, 10 or 50 million dollars, um, the Senate race in Texas, they spent 150 million dollars on that race. I'm not here to advocate for that. But what I said is, do we have enough resources? Do we have a way that we can take soup to nuts the full plan of actually going out and using political activism to buy microphones, to reach individuals, to get a platform. Somebody said to me once, Cliff, the problem with libertarians is they're throwing bombs from the sidelines, they're not even on the field, and the bombs aren't even reaching the stands. And when they first said it, I said, yeah, okay. But they said, no, really. They said, we are not playing on the field. So... We sat down and we said, all right, if you had minimal resources and you wanted to figure out a way to excite the movement and figure out a way to get people to take action, what do you do? And I'm telling you this story because I want you to kind of see how we got to where we are. Young Americans for Liberty has always been an educational entity, 501c3. And so if we were going to make this shift, we talked through where could we actually make an impact. So I'm a middle school math teacher by trade, and I sat down and we literally mapped this out. We said, okay, what's the tactic you would use if you want to get somebody elected that's a Ron Paul, what's the tactic you would use to be able to combat the establishment or the powers that be or the big money? Well, there's certain tactics you can use in politics. You can send mail, you can do TV, you can do radio, or you can do something that's more grassroots, like knocking doors or making calls. And we realized very quickly, you know, Somebody wants to write Jeff a check today for $20 million. They can have a TV ad up in about five hours. But what you don't have are activists who are principled and passionate about the ideas that we love. The establishment can't buy that. You can't buy young people especially, but that energy because we believe in something to go out and talk and do the work that nobody wants to do. So we landed on door knocking 
as the tactic we would try to test for this program. And then we said, all right, well, what do we want to do? do we said we don't want to burn money on presidential races and these statewide Senate races. And so we landed on doing this impact score I put together where we said, how many votes does it take to win each of these offices? We had about 20 offices listed, everything from dog catcher up to president of the United States. Is how many votes does it take to actually win that seat? Then we said, okay, how many doors would we have to knock to move the needle in that race about 10 points? The reason that's important is you want to be able to control the race enough, we'll get to this, that the politicians will fear you, right? That you have control over the race. If you get involved with grassroots, you're knocking doors in a race where they're going to spend $150 million, you're not faking them out and getting them to think that, oh, you're the reason that we won this race. So then we took how many doors we have to knock, we figured out the price, and then all of a sudden you do a plot of the price versus the impact of that office, meaning we had an impact score of what does it mean to liberty, to the principles of libertarianism, what does it mean to get somebody elected to president? And it's subjective, but put a number on it. Let's say you say 1,000. Okay, what does it mean for U.S. Senate? What does it mean for Congress? What does it mean for state legislature, mayor, school board, city council? And you compare the cost to the actual impact for liberty, and it slapped us in the face, we need to focus on the state level. So we got together with the team. We said, okay, should we be doing this? Should we be putting this together? And the idea was if we went out and we knocked doors, we thought we launched this program in 2018. We called it Operation Win at the Door. If we could elect, how many people we have to elect to make an impact across the country if I said, how many Ron Pauls do you want to have in state legislators throughout the country? It's a pretty interesting conversation. And where we landed was we think that we can win 250 of these races by the end of 2022. Now, I want to get to my point here, and we can talk details later. We've done 107 races. We've won 56 of them. Our rules are pretty simple. They got to be principled. They got to be viable. I don't care what political party they belong to. The Republicans hate me for that. Libertarian Party... Constitution Party, independent, they all hate us for that. We don't, we don't, I don't care about political party. I care about the ideas. So if you show us that you're principled and you can win, we will send students in anywhere from six to 10, put them on the ground for 30 days, win the race. 56 wins so far. So 56 Ron Paul type legislators now serving in state houses throughout the country. Does it matter? Like I said from the beginning, the premise here is I want to buy microphones. Now, let me say this, and I, I probably shouldn't say it, we're recording. Most voters, most individuals, you know, don't care. I don't want to say they're stupid, but they're not paying attention. If a local activist or somebody that's very involved wants to make a statement to the media where people's eyes are, right? We're trying to get an audience. We're trying to get people to listen. Local schmuck weighs in on tax policy. But you get 6,000 votes and get elected state representative. Now the headline, State Representative Smith weighs in on tax policy. It's legitimacy. It's credibility. We're trying to beat them at their own game. And so what we've built at YAL is this opportunity, we look at it, to buy microphones by having a program from soup to nuts to go in. We deploy, knock doors after we vet viable principal candidates. From there... This is the part the politicians don't like. We have a coalition. We call it the Hazlitt Coalition, where we actually hold the politicians accountable. People ask me all the time, what happens when somebody gets in and they go south? Because we've wasted millions of dollars at the federal level. We got somebody elected. They said they were a libertarian Republican. They get in. They're horrible. We keep them accountable. So we have literal staff members day in and day out tracking votes, getting ahead, providing model legislation, but working with them to figure out how we can keep them accountable. And when they screw up, guess what? Guy in Vermont, out of our 56 wins, we only have 55 left. Made an example of him right away. Voted for a $21 million tax increase. He's gone. So my argument today is if you can build a system where you can buy microphones to actually get out there. And by the way, this is the state level. Most of us do believe in states' rights, or at least, for God forbid, you know, pushing back on the federal government. If we can buy those microphones, if we can get people that now have a platform to speak, 
to call out the craziness. One person in a lot of these state houses is all it takes. You get one libertarian in. Just one person that can stand up for property rights. That can stand up and say, this is absolutely insane. You can call the circus what it is, a circus. And so our objective of 250 Ron Pauls, we think that political activism of buying those microphones could make a tremendous difference in the country for people finally hearing the principles of liberty. And uh, that's what I want to talk about today. Thanks, everybody.